Welcome to this lecture on business process management and in today's video I will talk about CMMN. CMMN is a language that you can use for process modeling. It's an alternative for languages such as BPMN, Petrinets, DMN or artifact-centric modeling of business processes. What is CMMN? Well, it's just like BPMN, a standard maintained by the Object Management Group, and it has been developed through a collaborative effort of several organizations. It's also a graphic notation. Why would we need CMMN? Well, CMMN was created to model the progress of a case. And cases are a bit different than processes. For cases, we assume that some form of planning at runtime is possible and also needed. In contrast to processes where all the activities are defined up front and also the sequence of activities is defined up front, for a case, the activities are not always defined up front. You have, for example, a collection of activities, say five, A, B, C, D, E, F, and you will do sometimes A, sometimes B, sometimes E and F, sometimes four of these activities, sometimes three of the activities. So it's not always exactly the same activities you are doing for each case. And also the flow, so the way you manage the case, is not repetitive in the sense that it can be case dependent. For some cases, you might first do B and then A, and for other, you might first do A and then B. And this typically happens when you are faced with knowledge intensive processes. So globally, you can say that in case management, initially individual cases are resolved and managed in a completely ad hoc manner. But then over time, a set of common practices can surface and so you can define then this set of common practices to manage the cases in the future in a more rigorous and repeatable manner. The target users of CMMN are quite diverse. So an example would be the service sector, for example, marketing, law offices or the medical world, where you deal with tasks where you do not follow a strictly predefined process upfront, but you adjust your way of working depending on the case you are handling. You also have organizations operating in an unpredictable market. For example, if you're dealing with very innovative products and new things, then of course, working along a predefined process may not be very uh, efficient and effective. And also companies active in knowledge or content creation are typical users of CMMN. For example, the design sector, if you think of web design, game design, graphical sector, you cannot always say that design happens according to a very strict predefined flow. It's going to be more an ad hoc way that you're going to follow to uh, design a website or a game, etc. And also companies operating in project management areas, for example, construction, need a lot of flexibility in how they perform their work. So they are also users of CMMN. The basic principle of case management is that at design time phase, so when you conceive the way you're gonna manage the cases, in this modeling phase, you will define tasks as part of your plan. So this would be your plan items. In this case, A and B are tasks or activities you will always do. But then on top of that, you can add what we call discretionary items. These are possible activities that you might want to do, but that, that will not always happen. So they are more case dependent. And then at the runtime phase, what happens then is that you create a plan where you put already activities A and B because you're sure you're going to do these. But then the case worker, depending on the characteristics of the a case he or she is handling can add C and D 
or only C or only D to the plan that is to be executed. Like I said, CMMN is a graphical language, so it has a number of symbols and each of their symbols has a particular semantics. So let's look at all these symbols. Basically, say the core of the notation is that a case consists of a case file model, a case plan model and a set of case roles. The case plan model is shown as a big folder with the name of the case uh, at the top of the folder and it comprises all the elements that represent the initial plan of the case and then also all the elements that support the further evolution of the plan through the runtime planning by the case workers. The case file item can be used to represent arbitrary content that you are going to need during the handling of the case. The case roles they authorize case workers or, of, or teams of case workers to perform human tasks, plan tasks based on the discretionary items and race user events. And eventually, um, the model also contains inputs and outputs to enable interaction of the case with its environment. A case is composed of stages and the stages can be discretionary. A stage is shown as an octagonal shape. It can be collapsed or expanded. If it's collapsed, you find a little plus. Uh, if it's expanded, there's a minus sign. And when it's discretionary, it has a dashed border rather than a full border. Plans and stages can contain tasks. The basic shape of a task is the same as in BPMN, so it's a rectangle with rounded corners. And when it's discretionary, it has a dashed border. And then you can identify different types of tasks. They are less numerous than in BPMN. So you find the non-blocking and the blocking human task, the one with a hand, the other one with a person. You have a case task shape where the task is in itself the handling of a case and you have a process task shape where the activity is actually the execution of a process, a process that you could, for example, define by means of BPMN. You can connect or govern the start and ending of the task by using sentries. A sentry watches out for important situations to occur or events that occur, and they will influence the further proceedings of a case. So a sentry will be a combination of an event and or a condition. When the event is received, you might in addition apply a condition to evaluate whether the event has effect or not. So the possible combinations are that you have an event part and a condition part in the form on event if condition, or you can have just an event part in the form on event, or you can have just a condition part in the form if condition. And the symbols that you use are a white and a black diamond. The, black, the white diamond is when the sentry is an entry criterion and the black diamond is when the sentry is used as an exit criterion. So here you see an example. You see you have task A and it's connected to task B via a sentry. And so that actually means that the event is will be that you will check for is that task A has completed. So the completion of task A is an event. And so the sentry could say on completion of task A, you can start B. Maybe you can add an additional condition like on completion of task A, if the quantity is larger than 50, do task B. And so you can in this way connect several components with each other. So for example, here you see at the bottom, to representation of the same stage, you have the stage S1 in its collapsed form on the left and it's in its expanded form on the right. And then you see that stage S1 has two entry conditions represented by the two white diamonds on the border of the stage S1. The stage S1 is itself composed of a stage S2 that is collapsed here in its representation. 
and it has three tasks, T1, T2, and T3. And you see that there's an exit condition on stage S2 that will connect to a sentry as a start condition for task T1, and task T2 and T3, they don't have sentries. Here's a more concrete example. We have a case for treating a fracture. So there's one task, examine patient. The exclamation mark will come back to it later on, means that it is mandatory. So you will always examine a patient. And then once you have done that, so when the examination of the patient is completed, you have a completion event, and that links to the sentry on performs x-ray. You could maybe add a condition to that to say like, if examining the patient is completed and the doctor has entered an x-ray demand in the system, then you perform an x-ray. And then you see discretionary tasks following after performing the x-ray. You could do a surgery, you could apply a cast, you could prescribe fixation. Depending on, on what is the problem, you could only apply a cast or you could first apply a cast and then later perform surgery, or you could prescribe fixation but no cast, etc. So these are three discre discretionary items, and the caseworker will plan what task will effectively be done for a particular case at hand. At the bottom, you see two other tasks. Prescribed medication is something that is always done, but it has no particular sentries, neither for the entry or the exit. And the same for prescribed rehabilitation. It has no sentries and it's a discretionary task. So depending on the case at hand, you may or may not prescribe rehabilitation. Then we also have planning tables. These can be used both for stages and human tasks. When a stage has a planning table, that planning table can be used for an instance of that stage to plan instances of the tasks and stages into that stage instance. So it's an instrument to actually make the planning concrete. The same for when a human task has a planning table. The planning table can also be used for an instance of that human task to plan the instances of tasks and stages into the instance of the stage that contains that instance of the human task. So when the planning table is closed, the idea is that you will not see the discretionary items, but you can also open a planning table and then you will see the discretionary items that can be added to the plan. So you see here the symbol at the top, you see a little bit of a table with a cross. So this now means that the planning table is uh, not expanded, but that it is uh, contracted. So when a user expands the planning table, it will show the discretionary items. They will become visible. And so that means they can then be added to the plan. We talked already about events when talking about sentries. We said a sentry can be formulated as an event combined with a condition, if desirable. So an event is something that happens during the course of a case. It may trigger via the sentries the enabling, activation and termination, termination of stages and tasks or the achievements of milestones. Anything that can happen to information is the case file can be an event and anything that can happen to stages, tasks and milestones can also be an event. So the completion or the activation or the start, all these things can be considered events and can be used then in a century. The elapse of time, however, cannot be captured via these standard events. So therefore you need an event listener that is specialized into, on the one hand, a timer event listener that you can use to catch a predefined elapse of time, or a user event listener that you can use to catch events that are raised by a user. So for example, if you want to have an event, for example, three hours have passed, you cannot use this as a regular event in a century, but you need then to include a time event listener into your case to show that, for example, three hours have passed and then you need to activate a certain task. You can also do this with, say, manually triggered events. For example, a user says, 
I'm done, I'm finished, that would be a user event and you can capture that or show that you want to capture that by using the user event listener symbol into your case. And then finally, you have the milestones as a symbol and they represent an achievable target that is defined to enable the evaluation of the progress of the case. There is no work associated to a milestone, but the completion of a set of tasks or the availability of key deliverables typically leads to achieving a milestone. So, for example, if you would make a case model for making your master thesis, well, the reaching the end, finalizing your master thesis text would be a milestone. And then, of course, you need to control somehow what is going to be activated when. And for that, you can use a number of rules. There are manual activation rules, required rules and repetition rules. So a manual activation rules specifies under which conditions, tasks and stages, once they are enabled, will start. And they can either start manually or they can start automatically. If something is enabled, the default is that it, is, that it starts automatically, but you could, for example, for certain activities, desire that you have to activate them manually so that they should not start by default, but that you would like to have a manual intervention to actually start them. In that case, you use a manual activation rule. The required rule. That is something you use to specify under which conditions a task stage and milestone will be required to complete or terminate before the stage they are in can complete. So if you indicate something as required, it means that the stage can never complete unless this element has been, com has been completed as well. And then finally, you can also use repetition rules that specify under which conditions the tasks, stages and milestones will have repetitions. Each repetition is a new instance of it. And the first instantiation is not considered a repetition. So you always have one and it's only as of the second that you consider this to be a repetition. You need a sentry as a trigger for the repetition. And you reference to that as an entry criterion. So put that at the beginning of the task. These elements are not applicable to everything. So you see here a copy of the table from the manual that says to which elements a repetition rule, a required rule and a manual activation rule are applicable. They're all applicable to stages and tasks. A milestone cannot have a manual activation rule and event listeners cannot have any of these uh, rules. You can use decorators to symbolize these uh, rules. So the exclamation mark is uh, used to represent a required rule. The hashtag is used to uh, symbolize a repetition rule. You can also have an autocomplete, which is symbolized with a black box and the manual activation is shown with a triangle. And so the table here gives again what is, uh, can be applied to what symbol. And so here we find a more complete example. So we have a claims file that show how to handle a claim. You see that you have three big stages in handling a claim. You can identify responsibilities. You will have to attach base information and you will have to process the claim. There are milestones such as responsibilities have been identified, the base information has been attached or the claims has been processed. You have discretionary tasks at the top level, change responsibilities, review documents and create letter. So as you can see here, you will identify responsibilities. This is your first stage. It contains one process task to identify responsibilities. So it means probably you have a BPMN process describing this activity. It contains an exclamation mark, so it means it's mandatory. There's a link, so when this completes this links to the sentry so the entry for the milestone responsibilities identified so this can happen or this milestone can be considered achieved when identify responsibilities has been completed 
This milestone in itself is then a condition to change the responsibilities if that would be needed. That's a discretionary task and it also has a repetition hashtag, so it means it can be repeated if needed. And responsibilities identified, the milestone, the completion of the milestone, milestone also links to the sentry of the activity create claims notification. And that activity is then in the stage attach base information. So there we see that create claims notification is a mandatory task and that we do have a discretionary item that can be added if it is needed. And it's a process task. So there's a process that describes how to do that. And it's about requesting missing documents. It also has a hashtag, so it can be repeated as often as needed. So when create claims notification is finished, then uh, that is just that event links to the sentry, the entry sentry of a base information attached milestone. When that milestone is completed, this links to the sentry of creating a claim. It's a discretionary task in creating process in the stage process claim and creating a claim is itself, as you can see, a case. So you will have to look into create claim to see what to do. We see there are two user events. There's one user event linked to an exit sentry. So you can simply terminate claims file as a user. And as a user, you can also trigger the uh, completion of the milestone claims process, which will also lead to the uh, exit sentry of this claims file case model. And there are then two additional discretionary items. You can review documents, you can repeat it. It's a manual task. And you also have a process task create letter that can be repeated if needed. In this slide, I show um, a CMMN model for making a PhD. And as you can see, you have three stages, a stage with the doctoral courses, a stage with the research and a stage where you complete the doctoral program. Um, Typically, you will do the doctoral courses in the first year and then start with your research. Some people wait a bit with starting the research, but other people do the two in parallel. So this is an example of the flexibility um, that you can show here with CMMN by just having the stages and there are no clear or enforced uh, sequences between those stages. Here in the doctoral courses, you can see that you have a kind of a sequence. You start by composing the doctoral program. Um, the end of this one is a condition to start following the doctoral courses. Um, and then here you have an exit criterion. Uh, you need to obtain an average of a distinction for a doctoral course to complete it successfully. And then you have a discretionary ta task to um, retake doctoral courses if you didn't manage to get a grade that was high enough. And then the milestone doctoral courses achieved is linked to the exit criterion for following the doctoral courses. When you have followed them all successfully, then the milestone is achieved. Um, the research consists of writing a research proposal, that's mandatory, writing conference papers, it's also mandatory, at least, of, at least one is mandatory, it can be repeated, you can write more, the more the better, and you have to write at least one journal paper, but here too, the more the better, so this can be repeated. Um, you will have to give a first seminar in order to give your first seminar. Your doctoral courses must have been achieved. You must have at least a research proposal. And that's why we have a user event here. Your promoter must deem you ready for giving your first seminar. And then your first seminar is a condition to give your second seminar. And here too, your promoter has to deem you ready for the second seminar. And then after that, you go to the preliminary defense. In order to go to the preliminary defense, your promoter must say you're ready for the preliminary defense. You must have a doctoral jury and your doctoral program must have been completely achieved. 
this milestone is achieved on condition that you have at least one international journal publication and that you have a total of six credit points uh, that was earned in your doctoral program. And in order to complete your doctoral program, you can guide master thesis students, you can provide teaching assistance, you can follow an academic writing class. Um, all these are discretionary items, so optional items you can uh, do to complete your doctoral program. And then after your preliminary defense, you can go to the public defense and having achieved this milestone is an exit criterion for the total plan of making a PhD. So this was in a nutshell what uh, BPMN stands for. Um, as you can see, it is um, mainly meant for uh, modeling uh, unstructured processes where there is a lot of flexibility needed in what activities to plan or not to plan. It is in a sense, a quite simple to understand notation. Compared to BPMN, we can see that BPMN has a much more complete set of events, um, has a more explicit modeling of the gateways and the routing uh, from between paths, different paths, and also BPMN um, has more tool support in general. So it, it's a more mature notation for which we find many more tools than we can find for CMMN. Um, much of the CMMN semantics can also be captured in BPMN. So it would be possible to model a flexible process in BPMN um, because discretionary tasks are a bit like non-interrupting event-based subprocesses. The sentry connections are, in a sense, sequence connections, and the, the milestones that are achieved, you could consider those as intermediate events. So you could get away with using BPMN to model the flexible processes. At the same time, CMMN probably has, will yield a more readable and a more understandable model than uh, if you would try to model the same with CMMN.